Beautiful. All right, I'm going to share my screen. We'll get started. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Lily. I'm the Director of Community Relations for the Pediatric AIDS Coalition. Um, and tonight we're going to have a discussion about the role of art and activism with our three lovely speakers. Um, first, we're going to get a little introduction from my co-host, Jacob Keir. Oh, so sorry. I'm still figuring out Zoom. Jacob, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm from Sherman Oaks in the Valley, which is technically in Los Angeles. I switched around my major a bit, but right now I'm majoring in uh, economics and human bio and society. I personally see art everywhere and find immense inspiration in everything I do. Uh, I use poetry uh, to process many of my emotions. Um, and in connecting my passion for both activism and art, this panel is a really special event for me. So sweet. All right, um, Jacob, I'm gonna let you take it away from now. So here we go. So we're gonna go one at a time and ask um, each of our speakers to introduce themselves um, and uh, say their name, affiliation or occupation, their pronouns, uh, what their position is and some artists they draw in inspiration from. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Gluckman. Um, I assumed I should just start talking because my name's on the on the screen. <laughs> Was that good? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Gluckman. I um, I'm an ambassador to the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. I currently serve as um, the project manager for a uh, traveling museum exhibition called Through Positive Eyes. What we do is we go from city to city. Uh, finding a group of people who are living with HIV, ask them to document their lives through imagery. Um, and we do live storytelling shows in the exhibition that we set up um, in the gallery. Uh, obviously that can't happen right now because of COVID. So everything is virtual. Um, oh yeah, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, what am I missing? Um, my inspirations. I am inspired by so many people, oh my gosh. Um, Mary Bowman is probably number one. Um, I am a spoken word um, poet. I am a storyteller. I am a performance artist. Um, my, I do visual art as well. I do collaging, um, but um, visual art is more of like a hobby for me. Whereas um, performance art is my passion and like my, my bread and butter and um, my hustle, I guess you'd say. Um, so my positionality, I am a, um, white cisgender heterosexual woman, um, which makes me a minority within the AIDS community. Um, and I try to use my positionality as a white cisgender heterosexual woman, um, to advocate for my community and to, you know, bring awareness to the fact that the H in HIV stands for human. Um, and, you know, I don't fit the, the stereotype, the silly stereotype that people think of when they think of an HIV positive person. So I take that as my um, responsibility to um, get my voice out there and to, to advocate for my community from that positionality. So that's me. Um, I'm going to ask Ema to go next, and I invite you to share your poem, if you'd like, uh, with us. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to Kelly. That was such a great way to kick us off. Um, and I'm inspired to hear what you've said already. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, hers, um, but I also am gender non-conforming. So I also, you know, go by they or them. Um, so I wrote something today. I've been having a lot of inspiring conversations. Um, I was recently awarded the Mary Bowman Arts and Activism Award, which was given by the National AIDS Memorial. And it was also sponsored by the Vive Healthcare Foundation. And, um, 
Mary Bowman, that's, of course, inspiration number one. I mean, yeah, I'm right there with you, Kelly, on that. Um, I mean, what a phenomenal multidisciplinary artist who was able to funnel their own experiences into just magnificent pieces of genius, you know, where that could be expressed to so many other people. Um, and then also Fannie Lou Hamer is a big inspiration that I constantly am drawing from, um, thinking about using your voice to speak for everybody, you know, not to say that you always understand their perspective, but to say that you can be as inclusive as possible um, and never silence anybody's experience because we need to hear all of these things. Um, so I'm also a multimedia visual artist and a performer. Um, so I did have a little poem that I wanted to share. Uh, I just wrote it today. So it's, uh, I don't have it exactly memorized or anything, but I hope you guys can bear with me. Um, all right. It's named Hail Mary Bowman because she was just on my mind and my heart, you know, and it's just that kind of time. All right. Hail Mary, they caught the past, piece from a quilt made by generations, moments placed in hours of glass and portraits of wonder. I could never still her thunder, but still I hail Mary. Ain't it scary to see the leaves turn? Ain't it airy to see the streets burn? Ain't it hard to remember a full face? and the outdoors filled with space, breathing of a time we used to know, a rhyme we used to soak in honey. Now we're praying, dying for money. So I'll stay a while, frame my smile, and hail Mary. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask Antoine to go next. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. A special thanks for Kelly and also Ema, who are both my colleagues and people I care about dearly. Um, I go by he, him, and his. And a little bit of my position related to HIV and activism. Um, I'm a part of the board of the National AIDS Memorial in San Francisco. And that's one aspect of me. I also focus on public health and technology. So merging those two aspects to create holistic approaches for people to be able to understand uh, and receive resources and information about sexual health and reproductive health. I'm currently working at San Francisco Department of Public Health as a links navigator, which work with people who are living with HIV, um, also dealing with uh, in experience and homelessness, substance usage, and also might be going through domestic violence. So any level of social determinants that you might think of, I work with clients on a daily basis to make sure that they are linked to these different systems to get housing, uh, food stamps, bus passes, uh, anything that you can think of that they might need legal. Um, I work with them on a daily basis. and along with doing those aspects of working with links navigation with San Francisco Department of Public Health. I also write blogs and articles related to people experiencing homelessness, policy reform, and also um, people who influence me related to HIV and other aspects of healthcare. Um, uh, I'm also living with HIV. I've been living with HIV since I was 19. I get ready to turn 28 next month so it's almost like a decade of me living with hiv and it's something that kind of influenced my decision making and understanding of how i want to engage with the world and also provide adequate information to people um, related to understanding if that status was to change from hiv negative to hiv positive um your life is not over etc so creating these different formats and um, dynamics to express myself through writing 
um, being in documentaries and other aspects of creative writing and creative thinking. So I uh, intersect in several different aspects of HIV and activism. Thank you. So we have some panel questions to go through now. Um, we're gonna start uh, and we're gonna go through uh, the panel in the same order that they introduce themselves, if that's okay. And we're gonna go through the first question, which is gonna be, um, what is your connection? Uh, what artists are, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Where do what you- Mediums uh, do you prefer to use and what are some benefits and drawbacks of that medium? All right. Um, so what medium do I prefer to use? Um, I don't know. I, I, it's like asking me to choose one of my children. <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> you know, collaging is what I do for like my personal art therapy. Um, uh, performance, like uh, spoken word poetry. I love and um, storytelling, I, I can't choose. I was also on the UCLA sex squad, which is an undergraduate theater troupe who um, we use, or they, now that I'm not a member anymore, unfortunately, they use their own personal narrative and humor to create sex ed theater and perform at high schools. Um, theater, oh my God, I would love to use theater again. Um, I haven't done it since I graduated from UCLA. Um, but I, I don't know. I also, I also do photography. Um, I don't, ugh, I like them all. You can't make me choose. I'm not going to. Um, and the benefits, the benefits of performance is like, that's, that's how I heal. Wait, art is how I heal. This is a really hard question to answer. I don't know, man, benefits there. I don't see any drawbacks to any of my mediums. I'm not answering this very well. I'm really sorry, this is awful. I'm doing a terrible job. I'm just blabbing. I'm, I'm gonna let um, Ima and Antoine take it from here because I'm clearly not doing it. It's not happening on this question. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass the mic. Oh man, that was um, that was funny. Is it is it on me now? Can I go? I'm assuming. Okay, so um, I agree. I love all types of mediums, um, like painting, like actual visual art. You know, um, definitely even painting on clothing and walls and like different types of places. Uh, spray painting. All of that stuff is so fun. I think everyone should be doing that on a regular basis. You know, I feel like it's good to explore all types of art, especially if you're just a creative, you wanna constantly be looking at different modes of how you can express that. But I do love filmmaking. Sometimes the drawbacks in filmmaking, I would say is the technology can be very daunting. There's a lot to choose from. There's a lot of ways you can go with it. And um, sometimes for me, I'm thinking more about exactly expensive. Okay, yeah, basically what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of barriers to filmmaking. You know, some a lot of people control the production of resources in that department. And if you don't have those assets, it's hard for you to, you know, make the type of media that you're looking for, but yeah. Um, the type of mediums that I use, um, like a multimedia approach. So through writing, also creative con uh, content through documentaries or creating like short films, et cetera, um, program development. And some of the benefits being able to control the narrative the way that we want to control it and want to be seen as black people or brown people or marginalized populations. Um, it allows us these different formats to kind of gain ourselves. 
and really put out a narrative that represents us and not having other um, influences tell our stories. So some of the drawbacks, I guess, related to like film along with the expenses are the people who put out the content related to who we are. Um, black and brown people and marginalized folks don't necessarily always get to construct those narratives that are being seen. So those are some of the drawbacks that I say that uh, with a multimedia approach, um, especially in film, if you're not one of the people who create or having those resources to create those narratives, uh, most of the time we're displayed in a way that are best fit in someone else's mind. So our next question is, uh, what is your connection to the community of individuals living with HIV or AIDS? Um, are we just going to continue going down the line in the same order? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. 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 If you guys want to have discussion amongst yourselves too, that's also wonderful. Okay, dope. Um, well, I've been living with HIV for over a decade, for 10 years and a little bit of change. Um, I, part of my healing was reaching out to other people who are living with HIV and developing connection and community with folks. Um, I was talking to people online. Um, I volunteered for AIDS service organizations in LA. Um, I, I go to support groups. I facilitate like arts therapy workshops. Um, I engage with my community as much as possible. Um, right now I'm managing, or I, I hate saying managing, but like I get to serve 11 other artivists um, in with Through Positive Eyes, the folks who participate in our program, we call them artivists, um, part artists, part activists. And um, so I uh, serve 11 folks um, in sharing their stories with uh, Seattle. Oh, I'm in Seattle, by the way. Um, I moved here for this job, for this project. So um, yeah, that's, you know, the HIV and AIDS community are my people, my people. So, yeah. Um, so for me, definitely a large part of my connection to the community began with developing a best friendship with Antoine many years ago in college and just sharing our backgrounds with one another and um, learning to think about health differently, you know, and we always thought about taking health into your own hands and being empowered to, you know, live your best life, no matter what types of different statuses you may be dealing with, whether it's mental health, you know, physical health, sexual and reproductive health, just across the board, um, learning how to feel good with whatever you're working with. Um, and then now my connection has been enhanced definitely through this award and the different, you know, collaboration that is going on across the board, um, different pieces that I'm taking part in and uh, just learning more about Mary and about other people and, um, yeah, still enhancing my connection, honestly. Um, my connections starting off, I live with HIV. Um, and then other aspects of connection with my status changing when I was uh, 19, it allowed me to create a larger network with different stakeholders, private institutions, um, colleagues, mentors, etc. cetera. Uh, it really caused me to be way more active with my engagement with my health and understanding of my health and creating narratives to work with other individuals who are just as motivated and just as um, polished in their different ways to want to elevate our society and uh, destigma, um, turn away from stigma, et cetera, and thinking about different ways to engage with our health. So people who uh, live with HIV and also people who are not living with HIV, figuring out ways to mend those aspects of um, 
mentorship, uh, leadership, thinking about aspects of workforce development. So when someone's status change, it causes you to look at yourself a little different and you want to know how you can stay healthy as much as possible and the ways that you engage with that uh, create uh, like create different opportunities for you to tap into networks like um, San Francisco Department of Public Health, Tugelu College, Brown University, thinking about other aspects of Vive Healthcare, um, all these different private institutions and government institutions and all the um, institutions that play a role into like the livelihood of what HIV looked like in communities and the marketing strategy. So it was my status change and actually influenced me and pushed me into a network to make sure that the next few years of decades of HIV is a different um, narrative. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, how do you relate to art to, how do you relate your art to HIV or AIDS? I forgot that I muted myself. Um, story of 2020, right? And 2021 so far. Um, well, all of my art is like based in my HIV and AIDS journey. Um, like I, I could like, here, I'll just bring out a piece, fuck it. Okay, so this is one of my um, visual art pieces that I'm in the middle of. Um, you can see like I'm playing with texture. It's like bigger on the outside and like going into the, it, it's a cave. Um, I am creating the texture to resemble a cave both like 3D wise and um, like visually 2D wise. And uh, I'm gonna do the rest of the texture up here and spray paint it black. Um, and then down the sewer here, I really want to go to a phlebotomist and have them take my blood. Um, and so I get like a vial of my blood and paint like down the sewer. This is a visual representation of how I felt like through my diagnosis. Um, and for a long time after my diagnosis with other things that happened in my life. Um, so this is like the proverbial like dark cave. And for a long time, there was no light at the end of the tunnel for me. I did not see the light. I was just taking one step after another, another um, just hoping that the light would appear someday. Um, and I have been working on this since 2017. I put it away at, like, I couldn't look at it. It's like too dark, <laughs> you know, but you know, the, the through line, the sewer, the through line is my HIV. So, um, HIV like manifests itself in many different kinds of ways. Um, my performance pieces are about different aspects of what it's like to live with HIV. Um, I've written uh, my favorite piece in the whole world that I've ever written is about dating and finding self-love while living with HIV. Um, I've written about my ex who I contracted HIV from. I, you know, like I, I've written about aging with HIV. I'm 34 years old. I know I don't look it, say it again. Um, <laughs> So aging with HIV has been on my mind. So like, it, it, it yeah, I'm just, you get, you get it. <laughs> Go ahead, Ema. Oh, wow. Um, that was so great. Uh, that art piece is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, definitely, I'm basically... I do a lot of consultation um, with others who have different experiences, both with HIV and AIDS and across the spectrum of SDIs and other health conditions that have been constantly portrayed in a tragic fashion versus in a dignified, you know, honorable, empowered way, you know? Um, 
I think that we have to always be mindful to not erase certain people on screen because the screen is a really important way for us to reflect ourselves, you know? And um, there's been a lot of groups that have been erased from screen. And I think that one of those communities that hasn't really been portrayed, um, especially as far as they just did a recent report is definitely characters that are living with HIV and AIDS and that's not a conflict and that's not the central conflict and it's not a tragedy. It's like, you know, something that is one component of a very full and fulfilling life. Um, yeah. Thank you both. Um, how you last and relate my art to HIV? Um, I kind of use my emotional intelligence. So when initially my status changed, the first thing I did was came up with strategies to start a peer health um, organization, peer health educators at Tougaloo College. So I use the framework of writing to get off, uh, to get my points across. So recently I just received a grant from San Francisco Department of Public Health and Helena Health to create a program related to public health and technology, focusing on redefining sexual health in San Francisco, with working with uh, African-American youth between the ages of 13 to 19. So I utilize my ability, uh, ability to write and think about ways to advocate through writing and uh, I work with big organizations such as San Francisco Department of Public Health or BEEV or thinking about ECR and all these different organizations to create healthier narratives to make sure that people of color, Black people, Black queer men, Black queer women, you know, trans women, et cetera, are people who are being represented, uh, represented and not looked at as a token because I'm no one's token. I'm an individual and I belong in these spaces just like anyone else. And I prefer to use my aspect to express through demonst uh, demonstration through writing, or if I'm at a public forum, I'm able to speak in front of people and I tell it how it is. I, tell it how it is. Um, I don't sugarcoat, I try not to necessarily um, beat myself up because it might make everyone else in the room uncomfortable um, because black and brown people are usually uncomfortable most of the time. So finding out ways to make sure that we are secure. And um, right now I just dropped a link to my, um, well it didn't pop up, but I'll put it in the chat to my writings to let you all see the aspect of writing I do. Great, thank you guys so much. Those are all such meaningful, important conversations that you're a part of. Um, and you're all involved, like you're all involved in such exciting endeavors. Like that's, that's really great to hear. Um, so something that I'm curious about is, we mentioned um, kind of the role that changing diagnoses plays, sorry, my roommates are in the background, but um, like changing diagnoses and changing status um, and the role that that kind of played in your art. Um, so I'm also curious about when you all first realized that you could use art as a tool for activism. So Kelly, if you wanna start us off. Sure. Um, yeah, I, well, I became, I was diagnosed in October of 2010 and um, part of the way that I healed through my diagnosis was telling my friends what I was going through and my friends would go and get tested. It happened over and over again. I was like, well, shit, I should be talking about this. And so I, I sought opportunities to share my story publicly. Um, so I did like an online campaign with the CDC. I did an MTV documentary special. I. Um, so I, I was doing like on camera type stuff and um, telling my story that way. And um, somehow I made my way 
to find the UCLA sex squad. Um, like I mentioned, I randomly stumbled upon them and I saw that they were using their personal stories for theater. And that was when it clicked for me. Um, I also uh, audited um, a course, a UCLA class called Art and Global Health, where they explored art as a way um, to promote global health. And so really, I, I found all of these, these things at UCLA, it's through the World Arts and Cultures Department, um, through the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. Um, their director actually found me from the MTV documentary special I did. It's, it's really strange how like I just opened one door and walked and then another door opened and then I walked and then, you know, these doors kept presenting themselves. So um, the UCLA sex squad was my first like light bulb moment where I was like, oh my God, like, cause I've always been an artist. I, I drew, um, I did the color pencil thing when I was a kid. I um, started sewing when I was 14. Um, I, I applied for uh, FITM for fashion design when I was 19 and I got, I got in to the school and um, my mom came with me to the financial aid meeting where they were like, okay, this is how much it is. And uh, my mom was like, so what's the starting pay once you graduate? And they were like 25 grand a year. And my mom was like, uh-uh, no. <laughs> That's not happening. And I'm like, but mom, there's no ceiling. There's no ceiling on what I can make. So I, I always wanted to be a creative. I always wanted to do art. I was very passionate about it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I stumbled upon the UCLA sex squad and that's when my, my passion for making pretty stuff um, met my passion for social justice and um, HIV advocacy and, and awareness. Um, yeah, so yay UCLA Sex Squad. <laughs> They're awesome, yay. you should check them out. <laughs> yay UCLA Sex Squad. All right, Antoine, do you have any thoughts? Um, ideally with me studying biology, my professors used to tell me to look at science like art and I used to then understand what he was talking about. But then once my status changed, I was able to see how I can utilize my emotions in writing um, and create like these narratives that are, that are in my head. I was able to create something in a physical format that was actual, actually ta um, tangible to be able to see. So once my status changed with that, I was a part of Vive Healthcare um, White Couch Talk, which I used to go to different states throughout the United States. Uh, and was able to work with different writers. Um, this writing company called Snow Companies and helped me structure my life at that current time. Um, and I was able to go to different states to talk to crowds between 60 to sometimes 120 uh, people, depending on the area, and talk about my livelihood with living with HIV. And at the time, I was like 20, 21, and um, so many people were able to see me capture my life in this capacity where I was young and I was vibrant and I wouldn't let HIV be something that determined who I was because um, I determine who I am and HIV is just a part of me just like it was my name and then I got into like documentaries, uh, magazines, panels, different interviews, speeches, uh, all these things when you are young and you take ownership of your HIV status it was able to like it pushed you in a different uh, direction compared to if you might not be going through things that uh, make you rethink about how your life should be. So uh, I was also a part of this immersive place. It's called As Much As I Can, which focuses on people who are living in Jackson, Mississippi and Baltimore, Maryland, working with uh, a company and Vive Healthcare and also a company in New York to create an uh, immersive play, which I'll put into the chat as well that you all can see, but it allowed uh, 
different areas throughout the United States witness this aspect of stigma in these places and how people who live with HIV and how people who are not live with HIV can foster these narratives of paradigms, et cetera, uh, to people living with HIV. So just understanding like writing uh, your creative process can literally be any aspect of art. So it's not just, not trying to framework it as if it's just painting or thinking about if it's just performance, but think about how you're an artist in your uh, structural, everyday scientific life, if that's something that you might choose to live with. Yeah, thank you guys. That's, that's really interesting to think about um, the different ways that art can apply in a number of facets. Um, so something that I guess we also want to talk about is kind of the dichotomy between art as a personal mm -hmm. subject and art as something to be shared with others. So to make it an actual slide, um, art can be made for oneself or for the purposeful consumption by others. Where do you kind of find yourself on that scale? Do you blend the two? Do you kind of have elements of both? Or do you find yourself kind of on more one side than the other? Kelly, you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a, this is a great question. Really interesting question. Um, I am, I do have ele elements of both. Um, I'm gonna grab another art piece um, because, oh, okay, all right. Okay, all right, okay, I'm back. So this is one of my favorite visual art pieces that I've ever made. Um, is this keep moving? Like, you know, visually, I guess it looks kind of cool. I don't think it's like brilliant or anything. Um, as like a consumer from the outside, just looking at this, you wouldn't realize just how much of my journey exists in here um, and how much healing this has brought about for me in my own personal journey. Um, I started this when I moved into my own place for the first time after I broke up with the person who I contracted HIV from. And um, I wanted it to look perfect. I'm a perfectionist. So I started like playing with texture and it wasn't turning out the way I wanted it. Um, and so I threw it under my bed and I was pissed off. I was like, fuck this piece of art. Um, is it okay if I curse? Is that okay? I feel like this is college. You can handle it. That's totally um, fine. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, I got really drunk one night and I brought out the art again and I started ripping the texture off with my fingernails and my fingers were bleeding. Like you can kind of see like the, the texture. I, I just ripped it off so that it was just flat again. And um, I was like, fuck it do you just have to keep moving? It doesn't matter if it's perfect. You just keep moving. That's what you do. That's what you do in life. So I painted keep moving in bright yellow over the top of it. And then I held it, I hung it on my wall for a long time. And um, eventually I got the, this was years. This was, I started this back in 2013. And then last year in 2020 in COVID, I got the inspiration for the green paint. Um, so this looked way different. And now like I left this at my exes when I moved and I've been like missing this piece so bad. Um, and I just got it in the mail yesterday and I put it up on my wall and I feel complete again. So, you know, this is, this is for my own consumption. I don't expect anybody to understand this meaning um, unless I go into that whole long story about it. So this is very personal, but you know, my spoken word pieces, um, my storytelling that is purposefully for the consumption of others. That's to raise awareness. That is to, um, a lot of my shit is really radical um, on purpose to get people to think. Um, I'm always thinking about my audience and what I want them to feel um, through my performance. So the one that I did about dating and self-love, I think many of you um, have probably seen um, 
you know, this is Pediatric AIDS Coalition. I know you all know my work. Um, it's my favorite piece ever. Um, and I will do it at every opportunity that, so if you wanna give me that opportunity, I'll totally do it, but that's okay. We don't have to, it's six minutes long, no big deal. Um, but like I did that one purposefully to make people feel uncomfortable because I'm asserting um, and I'm reclaiming my sexuality in a world that thinks that I'm gross and diseased and contagious. So um, yeah, my, my visual art is mostly for my own healing, my own consumption. Um, and I do share it with others, obviously, but my per performance work is, um, you know, for the amplification into the world. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was, I think that's a very beautiful piece. And I've been lucky enough to hear your spoken word a few times now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was really lovely. Um, Antoine, I'd love to hear some thoughts that you have on this topic. Um, I think I can go between both initially. For the most part, it's usually consumed by others, mainly because I'm very radical in aspects that I'm talking about in my writing or in my speeches or anytime I might have a platform to create like a narrative to make people think, actually realize like this uh, society that we live in and how we structure these aspects of ourselves. Um, so I appreciate Kelly kind of bringing that up a few seconds ago. Um, Kelly and I, we first met in 2017. We were both, uh, we're both Pedro Zamora scholars and we were able to speak in San Francisco. It was a year when Bill Clinton was there. It was a lot of heavy hitters in the building. And each one of us speeches were so radical that it was like we continue to shape the format of what people are thinking about people who are living with HIV or people who are not living with HIV, but making these narratives stick in people's minds that we are not just a sticker, we're not just like this status, we're not just this thing. Um, I'm more than that, I'm a scientist um, in public health, I'm a harm reductionist, I, I'm a writer, um, create content, program developer, I'm not just HIV. So when people, when I'm putting out narratives or if I'm experiencing like levels of homelessness or might be working with people who are using substances or whatever the case may be, to speak up and utilize my platform of education through Tugu College and Brown University and all my internships. And I utilize those platforms to create narratives larger than myself. Um, so regardless if that's writing article pieces, regardless if that's being on documentaries, regardless if that's applying for grants and grant writing, um, letting DPH know, letting other institutions know that there is a such thing as institutional racism. And it doesn't bother me if institutions are uncomfortable with that. They know that. So um, create these stories for ourselves. So most of the time when I put my art out, I make sure that it's definitely direct at different institutions, it's direct to different people, it's direct to like our society at large to become better people. Um, and then my kind of art to myself, um, this past weekend I just did like an art project related to turning one of my old nightstands and I painted it um, in fear, uh, in fear, no, it's a bright orange, but it's very bright. And I was able to change like the um, knobs and stuff. So sometimes I do little stuff for myself. Um, so it depends on what level of art because most of the time my art is coming out to address like large institutions. So sometimes it's good to just do your own personal stuff at home. By the way, speaking Sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Speaking to a crowd with Bill Clinton in it was the weirdest shit. Um, it was really interesting. Like he literally was sitting in like the first row. I got eye contact. I was like, what's that? That's the end of my anecdote, yeah. It must've been, yeah, that sounds like a really strange experience. It's strange. Um, but yeah, something you guys first brought up there was using art to cause conversations and bring awareness to these issues that a lot of times we don't talk about, whether that's HIV status or whether that's institutional racism or other stigmatized topics. Um, 
And for a little bit of context about myself, I didn't really get involved with a lot of social justice issues until very recently. Um, and one of the ways that I got into that was through art mediums and being exposed to things like that. Um, so something that I would like to know is how do you think art can facilitate conversation but other forms of activism can't? Which is broad, but um, I'd love to get your thoughts. Um, I don't know how to answer that, that question, to be honest. Um, I think, well, hold on, let me take a second. Antoine, do you have an answer on the ready for this? I feel like I need yeah. to marinate. Yeah, no, yeah. I'll let you go first. Um, I think art has the ability to utilize like emotions in a capacity that qualitative, I mean, quantitative data cannot provide. Um, you can read numbers all day about how many people living with HIV or how many people experience that homelessness. Um, but qualitative data, and that's what I kind of consider art and um, understanding like that level of activism to push out stories larger than ourselves and being able to understand people from a human point of view and not looking at them as numbers, understanding that they go through things and all these different levels of oppression and they might was born like might have to deal with like immigration, might have to deal with being poor, might have to deal with all these different levels that intersect um, and kind of cause people to have hardships in their lives. Art is give us that sense of like, I never knew that you was going through that. I had no idea how I made you feel, even though I didn't know that I was being biased in some type of way. I didn't know I, me clutching up my personal, kind of like scaring up when a black person walked past you, how they made somebody feel, or how a female feel, a female able person feel walking late night because they might have a skirt on. Like these, these conversations that art can provide sometimes, and you see that on screen or you reading it or you experiencing it in a conversation, it makes you really sit back and like, damn, I'm trash, you know, like, Maybe we're trash ass people if we can think, we can sit back and go every day in this sedated state of mind of it's okay if people are being put in cages. It's okay if people are being killed on, on the streets. It's okay if people are being raped. It's okay if this, this, and this. You know, it's not me, so whatever. Um, I think art create a atmosphere where people Regardless of if we disagree or we agree, we can really sit back and have empathy and sympathy for people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I The reason why I think it's so difficult for me to answer this question is because I see art everywhere. I'm like, what kind of activism isn't art, you know? Um, you know, you have protests where people go out with signs. Those signs are art, you know, um, and marching in the street, that is performance. Um, you know, art is an entry point. Um, it's approachable, you know, music, people love music. Music moves people emotionally and makes you feel and think things that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, you know, music can be activism. Um, TLC's Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls was about the AIDS crisis, you know? Um, and uh, most art is activism. You know, I'm thinking about um, all the songs that I love so much. Um, Kesha uh, Praying is activism, talking about sexual assault. Um, that song changed my life. Um, so, you know, art is, is just a, it's a great entry point for, for people to really, like what Antoine was saying, be able to identify and relate and emote and have compassion. Um, it's like, you know, opening the door and offering people to come in rather than, you know, pushing in 
people's faces, although both are necessary and useful. Um, so yeah, what forms of, of activism don't, are, are not art, um, right? There, I guess, you know, Antoine was talking about qualitative and quantitative data. There is like research activism, you know, doing research and taking the research to the policymakers and saying, we need to use change because of this evidence. Um, but that's not very approachable to the layperson. That's um, that's not, you know, that's for policy change rather than, you know, change of hearts and change of minds in, um, you know, our culture. Um, now I'm just thinking out loud. We can move on. <laughs> Those are great thoughts from both of you. Yeah, I mean, when I was first becoming exposed to so much art in all of its forms, this Kelly made great points. Um, it really did make me recognize my privilege and the things that I had been ignorant to in the past, um, which in its role in PAC and in the Pediatric AIDS Coalition and the HIV activism that our organization is involved with is generally geared towards getting people to realize that, like Kelly said earlier, the H stands for human. This is a human issue. This is something that affects everybody and something that we should all take seriously. Um, so my next question is, how do you see your work fitting into a larger mission of ending HIV and AIDS? So open floor for thoughts. Yeah, um, well, my my work has to do with um, destigmatizing, ending HIV stigma. So, um, you know, me standing on a stage saying, hey, I'm a human being, I deserve respect and love. And so does my community of people living with HIV is, um, you know, with every crowd I speak to, I'm changing, or hopefully changing hearts and minds toward, you know, what it means to live with HIV. And stigma is the biggest thing that keeps people from getting tested. People are too scared because they don't want to have to, you know, before I was diagnosed, HIV in my mind was for those people over there. And, um, you know, I didn't, HIV didn't fit into my worldview. And then all of a sudden you're diagnosed with HIV and, and you know, those people aren't over there anymore. I am those people. And, and that's something really difficult for people to face that when the stigma is, is so severe, it, um, it pushes people into denial about their, um, their risk behaviors. Um, and so it, it makes people less likely to go get tested. And if you test positive, um, it again will push many people into denial um, and keep folks from getting treatment. And when it, a person who's living with HIV doesn't e either doesn't have access to treatment or, or doesn't access treatment that is available, it makes HIV more transmissible. So, you know, the goal is to destigmatize so that more people are, are willing to go get tested and the people who get tested can get on treatment and become undetectable and so that they can't transmit the virus to their partners or, you know, other, well, partners and, you know, any folks who they might be having other kinds of contacts with. Um, so that's, that's how I see my work. I, I see myself like, I'm like a soldier on the ground and I'm also like on, I'm like a preacher on a soapbox at the same time. <laughs> Um, I don't know if that's great, if that's a great metaphor, but um, yeah, that's where I see myself. Um, initially, I see my work addressing the larger narrative that Black and Brown people need to take charge in creating these outcomes to end HIV and AIDS in our community. Um, so ideally working with different stakeholders and private institutions, um, like being like a sharp scholar at San Francisco Department of Public Health, working at the Glide Foundation when I first started my career, um, now working at San Francisco Department of Public Health, uh, ETR, Vive Healthcare, Gilead, institutions in Mississippi, um, working with all these different 
institutions throughout the United States to be able to facilitate and gain funding to make sure that projects and initiatives are being carried out that are sustainable for our communities, not so much like a conference or like panels or interviews. And those are great substances, but in the black community, we need stability and infrastructure. So utilizing my platform of education and um, privilege to being able to go to an HBCU and going to um, Ivy League private school, being able to work in all these different institutions. So utilizing those platforms to uh, get away from the idea of like, oh, well, I'm here, you know, I'm a black person, I'm, I'm here. I'm not okay with being the only black person in the space. That's not something I'm okay with and I'll never be okay with that, especially coming from Mississippi where Mississippi is like 37% black. Going to Tougaloo College, that's 97% black. Um, so I'm used to being in a back black, like a black background. That's just something that I'm used to. So to create inclusion, not just diversity, um, to allow me to create our own table. I don't necessarily feel like we have to always sit at the table together. We can meet up for a meeting, you know what I'm saying? But let us allow us to create our own narrative of ourselves. So. I utilize my platform of education and opportunities to demonstrate to the world what the world already knows, the abilities that Black people can do anything. That's great. You guys are both so great. I'm like, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, well, we are unfortunately running out of time, but I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it's a big one. Uh, there's a pandemic happening, and I am just to close wondering how has the pandemic changed your ability to carry out your art and your activism? Um, and I guess to close, what are some of the positives that come from the circumstances that we're under? Um, yeah, so a lot of my time in the pandemic has been trying to cope <laughs> with my mental health. Um, I'm very um, privileged to have the job I have. You know, the exhibition through Positive Eyes um, is all virtual. So my job just, you know, transferred from in gallery to all virtual. And so the tours that I'm doing are um, virtual. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of art as, as therapy for myself. Um, so that has been wonderful, but, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, one of the positives, I'm in Seattle currently and Antoine, if I'm not mistaken, is in San Francisco. So we, and Zoom, as I, I love and hate Zoom so much. I love it so much because I get to see people like you, the Pediatric AIDS Coalition, who I love, who when I was in LA, I was, you know, very engaged and I visited um, your meetings and, you know, I did dance marathon and I just, you know, I, I still get to stay connected with, with you folks and with, um, you know, people all over the world, frankly. Um, I, you know, I can engage with people from anywhere. Everyone's getting more used to being on Zoom, you know? So um, like, I'm thinking of like creating like a Zoom one woman show. Um, and I, I don't know, like I, like when I moved here, I thought it was so funny. Like I, I can like, hold on, like, okay, so. Like I can do funny stuff, like pop out and like back in and stuff. So I can like create my own theater show using like the structure, like in my house. So, you know, it's like caused me to get more creative with the things that I do. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't, I'm just, I'm out of it. I'm just talking to hear myself speak now. So. <laughs> I'm just really happy to be here. I'm so honored. I love you guys. I love this group. This is like heaven to me, being able to talk to folks in these kinds of forums. So 
Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I was actually digging the one person show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my level of art has been enhanced through the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic first started, uh, me and some colleagues actually been able to work together to feed people who was experiencing homelessness in Berkeley, California. Um, that's where initially I stayed out here in the Bay Area. And we created like over 500 meals within the first month of the pandemic and came up with fundraising opportunities um, along with being able to provide personal hygiene et cetera, to people experiencing homelessness in Berkeley. So we were able to reach over almost like 500 people. So the ability to do that and work with people, we were able to construct um, an abstract to be accepted to the International AIDS Conference last year, along with the COVID-19 conference last year. So the pandemic shifted us in our direction of thought to enhance these issues and were able to be on a national conference that uh, was pretty dope and being able to be recognized throughout the United States and nationally and internationally as well. So that was an opportunity that because of the pandemic, it created this narrative of urgency and understanding like people that I work with, because I'm working with people on an everyday basis uh, who's experiencing homelessness and food insecurity. Um, to still take the initiative during the pandemic because I've got my first three months off uh, working from home. So I was able to create other narratives. And now I'm back working in um, the office. So I go to work every day and I've been going to work every day since like July. So initially I go to work and I continue to write. So when I'm feeling down or if I feel like the world is too much, uh, I initially try to create article pieces or some format of grant writing to get funding. So um, it kind of enhanced my ability right now during the pandemic to see that I can utilize writing even more right now. That's great. Congratulations on those abstracts. That's very exciting. Um, I'm going to skip the last question, but uh, that is our time. So thank you guys so much for being here. I This was so interesting and it was, really an honor for us to have you guys. Um, do you guys have anything to promo or plug? I don't know, contact, Instagrams, things like that? Sure. Um, follow me on Instagram. Um, I don't post very much, but I'll follow you back. I should post more. I'm thinking of doing a vlog also. Um, through Positive Eyes is at the Gates Discovery Center. We do online virtual tours. I, I believe Lily, you and I are gonna talk about doing like a tour for, for PAC. The yeah. Yes, we do have um, several of our artists are verticals. So um, their stories are, are particularly um, important for you all to experience. Um, I have how many verticals, four, three, four, anyways, um, yes. There's that and at Kelly Gluckman on Instagram. I don't do Twitter. I have a Twitter. I just don't, I, don't, I never got it. It's okay. I don't do Twitter either. Right. Antoine? And, um, thank you all. Uh, ideally, I only have a LinkedIn. I deleted like social media going on four months now. So yes. uh, I just have my LinkedIn. Um, and then you can follow me there. <laughs> and um, the last thing I want to say, thank you all for having me. And it was a nice opportunity to once again see Kelly and Ema and all new faces. Um, so if you need anything, just hit me up on LinkedIn. And also, can you send the record to Ema when you yeah, get a chance? Sure. Yeah, okay. Of thank you. Right. Thank oh. you so much for having me. Antoine, it was so nice to see you. Oh, my gosh. It was really good to see you, too. Yeah. Right. Bye, guys. Bye.